Oh, hi there. I was just uh, looking over my notes, making some highlights, uh, rereading, rewriting, if, it, if you will. I'm Jason McCoy, instructor of psychology. Welcome back. Um, it's wonderful to be here again from the Cape Fear Community College Light Board Studio. Today I'd like to talk about learning. And before I do that, before we jump into it, I'd like to uh, ask you, what does it mean to you to learn something? Now, if you're like most people, it's rather obvious and quite complex at the same time, isn't it? I mean, that we learn is pretty obvious, but trying to define it gets a little tricky. Some people throughout history have referred to learning as simply pouring knowledge into someone, right? So a teacher, in order to ensure his students learn, for instance, would merely need to fill the bucket of the mind, as it were, with facts and information. So learning in this way is a matter of passively waiting for someone to instill or bestow knowledge within, into you or within you, upon you. And your job, of course, would be to simply be willing to accept it. Other definitions, of course, uh, turn to a more active theory. The idea is that as long as you, the learner, are curious, as long as you, the learner, are open and willing to engage with the world, with the teacher, with the information, then you can acquire knowledge. Behaviorists, including B.F. Skinner and others in psychology, looked at learning very specifically by examining the consequences and the antecedents, that is, what comes just before someone learns a new behavior was thought to matter most. In the 1950s, American psychologist B.F. Skinner observed animal behavior to try and understand human behavior. He trained a rat to press a lever for food pellets. If it received them at regular intervals, it would only press when hungry. But if the food was given randomly, if the rat never knew when it was coming, it would press the lever again and again and again. It worked on pigeons and it worked on humans too. Let's do a thought experiment. What would you do if you wanted to learn something? What if you wanted to prepare for an upcoming exam, say in psychology? What would you do specifically to prepare? Now imagine that you did those things and you still failed the test. What now? I'd like for you to rethink your strategies. I'd like for you to toss out any of them that you don't think are really helpful. And I want you to think specifically about being successful this next time around, whether it be a retake of the first test or whether it be an alternate test. Now, let's suppose that doesn't work. Now what? Perhaps we need to ask more people, ask more students. What if we asked or polled or crowdsourced a large number of students across America and asked them what they do to prepare for exams? Researcher in learning named Roddy Rodinger at the University of St. Louis in Washington and his colleagues did just that. They polled a sample of about 177 students from across the university about 10 or 15 years ago, asking very specific questions. Which techniques or strategies do you employ in order to prepare for an examination? The first thing that students said and this was the 11th most common answer given out of those 177 students, was that they generate real life examples. Number 10, they use, yep, the good old fashioned highlighter. The good old fashioned highlighter. Number three, or excuse me, number nine, they do what's called practice recall. Uh, essentially calling out notes to one another or having a parent or a boyfriend or friend call out notes to them. They make outlines, that is they summarize information. They use mnemonic devices or uh, what's sometimes called memory tricks. 
Think about, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally for the order of operations in mathematics. Number six, wrote rehearsal. That is, they simply grind it out, they persevere, they take the time and energy necessary to memorize their notes, to memorize the readings. They study with others, that is, they try to crowdsource and maybe leverage the human capital they have. Maybe some of their better classmates or friends will split the workload so as to make the process of learning more efficient. They, of course, rewrite their notes. Now, for the top three strategies that the majority of students said that they used. Not only that, but in a follow-up question where students were asked to only indicate their top, top strategy, the one they used the most, these are really the three that appeared at the very top. Number, uh, excuse me, the first, which on the original list was number three, is flashcards. That is making flashcards, study cards. Number two, practice problems. This is especially common among students who take math classes. And finally, the number one most commonly reported learning strategy, the number one strategy most students said they used most often, re-reading, going back over the chapter, going back over the handouts, going back over their notes. That this is what most of you at home probably thought when I asked you originally, what would you do if you were preparing or wanted to be successful at a test? Now, of course, I said, what would you do if that didn't go so well? If you used one or more of these strategies listed here. Bottinger and others went back and asked these same students, hey, imagine that you failed that test after using your favorite strategies. What would you do then? I asked you the same thing, what then? Believe it or not, most people said they would do the exact same things. That's right, the exact same things. They just make more flashcards. They spend more time flashing them to themselves. They do more practice problems in math. They would read and reread and reread again. In other words, it was almost as if they were blind to any other possible way in which to prepare or learn. It's as if the bias towards doing these combination of things is so ingrained in us that they can't even think outside the box and consider doing something different. The only thing they can consider is they just have to grit it out, persevere, and do more of it. It's as if, again, that these strategies are good strategies if only you apply them with great determination and great effort. And of course, this is exactly what would be expected if the last 50 to 100 years of laboratory research kind of supported that notion. Take a look here at a prototype of the kind of research I'm talking about. Uh, this graph here is actually the result of a study by Endel Tolby, a great learning theorist. And in 1962, he plotted these results. Students were given an opportunity to study first and then pretty shortly after the study session, indicated by an S, they would take a test on the things they studied. And the T here stands for test. And if you notice, at the bottom axis, you have trials. This is the number of times Tolby asked his students to do this combination of studying first and then wait a short while and then take a test. In this case, the test was what's called a free recall, where you get a blank sheet of paper after studying, say, a list of words, and you try to recall as many as you can remember from that study session. And what you notice is a very nice patterned graph, a curve, if you will, whereby the more opportunities a person has to study and then subsequently test on it, the sharper or the more recall ability will occur. Two things you notice from this curve. Number one, that's an awful lot of study trials in order to, what, recall maybe a maximum of 90, 88%. Secondly, despite all of these study trials, in some cases 10, 15, 20 study trials, the average person never remembered 100%. Now, this is absolutely fine. If you don't mind not remembering 100% of what you studied, and or you take the test 
really, really quickly after you've studied the information. But what if you want to do better than 88%? What if your test isn't until a week or two weeks or midterm or the end of the semester before you're asked to recall the information? And finally, what if you want to make the most efficient use of your time? You want to optimize what time you have in between taking care of loved ones, working, other classes, and just generally living life. You may not have time to study, study again, and study another 10 or 20 times. So we must be missing something. There's got to be another piece or two of the puzzle that we are just not thinking about or that we are missing for some other reason. What could it possibly be? Could it be the instructor? Is there something about me that is making it difficult to either communicate or, if you're the student, understand what I'm trying to convey? Should we get a different instructor for your class? Should we flip the class and allow you guys to be the instructor? You guys come in and present to me? I had a lot of bad instructors growing up. And it seemed as if I did pretty well nonetheless. I've also had some very amazing instructors, and I didn't always necessarily do that well. Rate My Professor is full of examples of this. There are Nobel Prize winning professors out in the world who are on Rate My Professor, and students actually say, this is not a good instructor. This is not a good teacher. The person really doesn't know what they're talking about. That's incredible when you think about it. Maybe it's not the knowledge that your instructor brings to the table, but maybe it's just his sense or her sense of style, right? You just don't jive with it. It just doesn't work for you. There's a mismatch between your instructor's sense of style and your sense of style. Now, oh, no, no, I don't, I don't actually mean that kind of style. I mean this kind of style what researchers throughout the last 50 to 70 years have called learning style. And if you're alive, you've probably heard of learning styles. Uh, here's a gra uh, graphic example of some of the different categories of learning styles that you, your friends, and everyone you know allegedly can potentially have. Right? So some students are just better at listening or better at seeing, or better at processing information on an emotional level. Some students are more musical. Some students are more logical, mathematical, analytical. And so recognizing that, teachers, it's alleged, would do themselves and their students a great value if they would merely tailor their instruction to each and every one of those students. Now, I don't need to go into great detail explaining some of the obvious problems with the learning style matching the instruction to the student's approach. All I need to do is remind you that teachers don't make a lot of money. They already work an exorbitant number of times. They already expand, expend an incredible amount of energy. Stu teachers, for the most part, are already very creative and very selfless. Asking them to modify their instruction so that it tailors the specific learning styles, as seen here, of each and every one of their 15, 24, 50. Hey, I have a colleague out in California that teaches 1,400 students every class. What then? But never mind the logistics of doing it. Let's take a look at the theoretical basis and or the empirical evidence because certainly there's got to be something strong to support learning styles, right? 90% of people believe in learning styles. About 70% of teachers believe that learning styles matter. Let's see what an expert in learning science named Robert Bjork, also from California, the University of California, Los Angeles, has to say. An attitude that's very prevalent societally is that you have a personal style. The teacher will only present the material in a way that meshes 
with your learning style. There are no effort on your part of required. Learning will just kind of happen. This is what you can be good at, what you're bad at, is almost like predetermined by your innate abilities. And I think it has a bunch of costs. It leads people to underestimate their learning capacities. It leads people to give up on whole domains of learning, like let's say mathematics, based on some early test. They decide that's not their thing. It's very appealing to people. The only problem is there's no evidence for it. So I was one of a four-person team that reviewed all the available evidence on learning styles and it simply doesn't have a research foundation. It's counterproductive in several ways, namely it leads people to just assume that they shouldn't go into certain domains maybe because they think their family's not good at it, their ethnic group is not good at it, and so on. And so in that sense it's very counterproductive in limiting where people go, what they try to do and stuff. But it's understandable at the same time why it's so appealing. On the one hand, we all love to feel we're individuals. And I could talk to you about your learning style, you can talk to me about yours, and people like to talk about that endlessly. Another dimension is suppose you're not doing as well as you want in some context, or your child isn't doing as well, what's the problem? Well, it's not your problem or your child's problem, it's that the people the teachers aren't teaching in a way that meshes with your style or whatever. So it has that benefit of being able to kind of uh, point the finger at somebody else if you're not doing very well. So, Mr. Bjork suggests that there is no systematic evidence to support learning styles. Therefore, he argues that it is not only unnecessary, but maybe even counterproductive in some ways. He says it may actually lead to bias. It may actually lead to students making stereotypical judgments about themselves, right? If I can't learn math, maybe it's because I'm simply not analytical or mathematical enough in my learning style, suggesting that there's nothing I can do about it. These are biological categories. It's my style of learning given to me through a genetic heredity. Also, it might actually discourage people from continuing their studies in certain subjects or certain lines. For instance, I may say after a few hiccups or after a few troubles, a few bad grades, I'm just not cut out for this. I'm going to go a different direction. Now, Robert Bjork says that learning styles are not really supported by science. Therefore, are we to now believe that the interaction between instructor and student doesn't matter or that it matters less? I'm not so sure. And neither is this gentleman named Dan Pink. I need to make a confession at the outset here. Uh, a little over 20 years ago, uh, I did something that I regret, something that I'm not particularly proud of, uh, something that in many ways I wish no one would ever know, but that here I feel kind of obliged to reveal. Um, in the late 1980s, in a moment of youthful indiscretion, I went to law school. Um, I want to try to dust off some of those legal skills, what's left of those legal skills. I don't want to tell you a story. I want to make a case. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, take a look at this. This is called the candle problem. Some of you might have seen this before. It was created in 1945 by a psychologist named Carl Dunker. Carl Dunker has created this experiment that's used in a whole variety of experiments in behavioral science. And here's how it works. Suppose I'm the experimenter. I bring you into a room. I give you a candle, some thumbtacks, and some matches. And I say to you, your job is to attach the candle to the wall so the wax doesn't drip onto the table. Now, what would you do? Many people begin trying to thumbtack the candle to the wall. Doesn't work. Some people have a great idea where they light the match, melt the side of the candle, try to adhere it to the wall. It's an awesome idea. Doesn't work. 
And eventually, after five or 10 minutes, most people figure out the solution, which you can see here. The key is to overcome what's called functional fixedness. You look at that box and you see it only as a receptacle for the tax, but it can also have this other function as a platform for the candle, candle problem. Now, I wanna tell you about an experiment using the candle problem done by a scientist named Sam Glucksberg, who's now at Princeton University in the US. This shows the power of incentives. Here's what he did. He gathered his participants and he said, I'm gonna time you how quickly you can solve this problem. To one group, he said, I'm gonna time you to establish norms, averages, for how long it typically takes someone to solve this sort of problem. To the second group, he offered rewards. He said, if you're in the top 25% of the fastest times, you get $5. If you're the fastest of everyone we're testing here today, you get $20. Okay, now this is several years ago, adjusted for inflation. It's a decent sum of money for a few minutes of work. Okay, it's a nice motivator. Question, how much faster did this group solve the problem? Answer, it took them on average three and a half minutes longer. Three and a half minutes longer. Now this makes no sense, right? I mean, I'm, I'm an American, I believe in free markets, that's not how it's supposed to work, right? <laughs> if you want people to perform better, you reward them, right? bonuses, commissions, their own reality show, incentivize them. That's how business works, but that's not happening here. You've got an incentive designed to sharpen thinking and, and accelerate creativity, and it does just the opposite. It dulls thinking and blocks creativity. And what's interesting about this experiment is that it's not an aberration. This has been replicated over and over and over again for nearly 40 years years. These contingent motivators. If you do this, then you get that. Work in some circumstances, but for a lot of tasks, they actually either don't work or often they do harm. This is one of the most robust findings in social science and also one of the most ignored. I spent the last couple of years looking at the science of human motivation, particularly the dynamics of extrinsic motivators and intrinsic motivators. And I'm telling you, it's not even close. Let me show you what I mean. So Glucksberg did another experiment similar to this, where he presented the problem in a slightly different way, like this up here, okay? Attach the candle to the wall so the wax doesn't drip onto the table. Same deal. You were timing for norms. You were incentivizing. What happened this time? This time, the incentivized group kicked the other group's butt. Why? Because when the tax are out of the box, it's pretty easy, isn't it? <laughs> if then rewards work really well for those sorts of tasks, where there's a simple set of rules and a clear destination to go to. Rewards by their very nature, narrow our focus, concentrate the mind. That's why they work in so many cases. And so for tasks like this, of narrowed focus where you just z see the goal right there, zoom straight ahead to it, they work really well. But for the real candle problem, you don't wanna be looking like this. The solution's not over here. The solution's on the periphery. You wanna be looking around. That, re that reward actually narrows our focus and restricts our possibility. Dan Pink believes that there are two types of incentives, intrinsic and extrinsic. Of course, intrinsic being those ones that are within you, the drive to no, the feeling of, of eagerness, the curiosity that obviously blooms inside many of us, particularly when we're young. He also argues that extrinsic motivators are a likewise important force, motivating us to do all sorts of things, particularly, particularly tasks that are easy where there's a known end goal. Obviously, what he calls sticks and carrots are important to humans. But what he is suggesting is that the incentive structure, whether it be intrinsic motivators or extrinsic motivators, need to be doled out, need to be used carefully in a more nuanced way. In a transactional way between you and say a person who's buying something from you at your place of business, it's obviously about sticks and carrots. If you 
pay me what I asked you and you walk out of the store, everybody's happy. If you don't pay me what I asked you and instead put the uh, object under your jacket and walk out of the store, then you'll get the stick because I'm going to, of course, call law enforcement and you'll be punished. That tends to work in a transactional relationship. But of course, what about grandma? Imagine Thanksgiving with grandma. You know she spent a lot of time and effort, maybe 60, 70 years perfecting Thanksgiving dinner. You finish Thanksgiving dinner very, very quickly because you've got other things to do that day. And without saying a word to grandma, you just simply put a $20 bill underneath your empty plate and you leave. Grandma gives you a call the very hour and is angry with you. Why? Because you didn't contribute enough to dinner? I doubt it. She's insulted that you pay her as if Thanksgiving dinner was some transaction. Grandma wanted you to stick around, to give her a hug, to tell her how much you enjoyed the meal. Grandma wanted to spend time with you. Grandma wants to get meaning and value out of the relationship with you, not your money. This is a type of relationship. So relationships with friends and family, and I dare say maybe even with teachers and information and school in general, needs more nuance. It needs more massaging of intrinsic motivators. Dan Pink says that we need to treat business sometimes and treat education and classrooms with relational motivators. Students want to feel important. Students want to be recognized. Students want to know that their instructors care about them. They want to feel that authenticity, that compassion, especially at a time like we're in now with COVID-19. Students want to know that teachers have their back, that they value them. Speaking of kids, it is true that children seem to have a natural curiosity, a natural drive for things that tickle them intrinsically. Perhaps this is why kids seem to be so focused on learning. Perhaps it's why kids can learn so quickly, why they're so eager and curious, seem to love thinking about computers and games. They are future oriented. They are big into this digital age. They want the world of education, teachers, schools, courses, information, tests, to almost be a game, to almost be a game. So is that all it takes? Is to simply convert our system into something that is more fun, more game-like, more childlike? Well, I'm not so sure exactly. I'm not so sure. Because think about this. While children love robotics, artificial intelligence, even coding, even math, not all adults do. I'm not so sure that you would want me to turn the psychology class into a math class. I'm not so sure you'd want me to give you coding, programming homework. I'm not so sure you would find the tedium of learning a different language, a mathematical language, as fun as, say, a six or seven or eight-year-old. It's just that we maybe, maybe, maybe are not ready to throw the chalk away quite yet. Maybe what is old can be made new again. Maybe it's less about your abilities to learn, less about your age, less about your instructor, less about my style or your style. Maybe even it's a little bit less about the incentives than we might um, believe otherwise if we listen too closely to Daniel Peake. Maybe it's a matter, matter of perspective. What if it's about the meaning you give to the situation? Let's take a look at one fellow named Mark Roper who believes just that. About a year ago, I asked my YouTube followers to play a simple computer programming puzzle that I made with a buddy. The object of the puzzle was to get your car across the maze by arranging these code blocks 
that represent typical computer programming operations, such as if-else statements and while loops. Once you thought you had a good code, you would hit run, and your car would move based on the commands you had in the program. So I asked my YouTube followers to play it because I said I wanted to prove that anyone from any background could learn to code. 50,000 of them took the challenge and attempted the puzzle. But the truth was that I didn't actually care about proving that anyone could learn to code. What they didn't know is that we actually randomly served up two slightly different versions of the puzzle. In one version, if you hit run and you weren't successful, you didn't lose any of your starting 200 points. We showed you this message. However, in the other version, if you hit run and again, you weren't successful, we showed this slightly different message, stating that you lost five points from your starting 200 points. That was the only difference. In one version, if you failed, we simply took away five, no value in the real world, no one will ever see these completely meaningless fake internet points. <laughs> that minor difference is crucial to keep in mind for the results I'm about to show you from the 50,000 data points we collected. For those who are penalized for failed attempts, their success rate was around 52%. For those who were not penalized, their success rate was 68%. That statistically significant delta of 16% was really surprising and almost seemed too hard to believe until we looked at another piece of data that we collected, which was attempts to solve before finding success. It's shown in orange right here. So those who didn't see failing in a negative light nearly had two and a half times more attempts to solve the puzzle. As a result, naturally, they saw more success and therefore learned more. So if you think about that and sort of unpack these results, the trick to learning more and having more success is finding the right way to frame the learning process. I'd like to tell you about a plumber I first met when I was eight years old. He was Italian. <laughs> when Super Mario Brothers came out, my friends and I became obsessed like, we wanted to get to the castle and rescue the beautiful Princess Peach from the evil Bowser. We get to school and ask each other, like, dude, what level did you make it to? Did you pass the game? We never asked each other about details on all the different ways we might have died. When it comes to games like this, no one ever picks up the controller for the first time, and then after jumping into a pit, thinks, I'm so ashamed, that was such a failure, and they never want to try again, right? What really happens is they think, oh, I've got to remember, there's a pit right there. So I think next time, I'm going to come out with a little more speed. I'm going to jump a little bit later. The focus and the obsession is about beating the game, not how dumb you might look if you get hit by a sliding green shell. And as a direct result of that attitude, of learning from but not being focused on the failures, we got really good, and we learned a ton in a very short amount of time. We were the right side of this graph. This is what I call the Super Mario effect. But by reframing the learning process and focusing on the cool end goal, the fear of failure is often taken off the table and learning just comes more naturally. I'll close with this thought. Someone came up with this cartoon and I totally love it. This is so true, but often in life we tell ourselves that the top version is what we want, that's what we expect. But then something happens, maybe it's a really bad grade on a test or a meeting with a client that goes horribly wrong, maybe it's a bad breakup. Maybe we miss a wide open shot. Some kind of green shell hits you. And so at that first setback or sign of failure, doubt creeps in. We tell ourselves we're not good enough or we're not smart enough. And yet, if the bottom rectangle here is a game where now your bikes crash and you have to get your bike across with a flag, it's not, oh, I hit these rocks, I'm just gonna leave my bike here, I'm not good enough, and you quit and walk away. You see that flag to the right and you're like, nah, like what did I just learn? You're like, okay, next time, I think I'm gonna come out with more speed and I'm gonna, I'm gonna lift the front of my bike up. You wanna try it again, you're immediately excited to go for it again. We sort of tell ourselves we want our life's challenges to look like the top one, but that's boring. If that were a real video game or a book or, or movie, and that went out to the market, it would be a total failure. Nobody would buy it. Where's the risk and the reward? Where's the challenge? There's no feeling of satisfaction. The bottom picture is real life and that's not a bug, that's a feature. Wow, wow is right. The Super Mario effect. Mark Roper, a YouTube sensation. Yes, he's got several Guinness Book of World Records for the largest super soaker and the largest uh, or the fastest snowball uh, machine gun. This guy seems to have it all, doesn't he? He makes learning fun. I bet his 
his nephews just absolutely love him. And if he were a teacher, I bet his students would absolutely love him as well. But once again, once again, we have to look very carefully at what Mr. Roper is saying. Is he suggesting that teachers need to be like him and be inventive and creative and use a lot of their own money and their ingenuity? No, I don't think so. Is he suggesting that everyone can learn to code, everyone could learn to do mathematics and do logical problems? No, I don't think so. Instead, what he is saying that is that a lot of the tasks that we find boring, that we find monotonous, that we find too difficult, is really the result of the way we look at the task, specifically the way we frame the task or think about failing at the task or making errors. He said if we simply look at it, the task of learning, any subject for that matter, math, vocabulary or otherwise, as sort of a game, but also as something that you have the potential to get better at, then you won't necessarily focus on, as he says, the pitfalls. You won't focus on every little tortoise shell that might hit you unexpectedly. Instead, you will, to borrow from computer science, start to recognize that error making, that mistake making, is not a bug, but a feature. When you think about the standard model of learning and memory, the one that's been sort of touted for a hundred years at least by everybody from educators to psychologists and everyone in between. The idea is that learning is quite passive and that we have to wait and allow information to be poured over us. And yes, even when learning becomes active, there are some sort of tried and true things that we all need to do from highlighting, to reading, and then of course rereading, writing, that is fine. That is absolutely fine if, again, you don't care about remembering everything for the day, as Tolvin's original research in 1962 demonstrated. And it's also fine if you don't mind studying, restudying, or writing, rewriting. If you don't mind doing these things over and over and over, in order to maintain the amount of information along that learning curve that you can recall, that's fine. But there's also another problem with this approach, this model. It suggests that learning is really something that takes place so as to produce the correct answer for some type of test that if you can reproduce the correct answer on a test, that somehow that demonstrates learning. It seems as if in this situation, we've kind of fallen prey to thinking about the test or the activities associated with assessing learning too differently from learning itself. In other words, in this scenario, in this standard model of learning, the test is really the proof that you've learned or you haven't. Researchers over the past 25, 35 years, like Robert Bjork, Roddy Rodinger, and others, suggested that maybe we shouldn't wait for our teachers to give us the test. We shouldn't think about learning as something that we simply have to reproduce for a test. What if we flip this on its head and instead of using the test as an activity to determine whether or not we know something, we start taking the test earlier. It turns out that students who in fact know what they need to do in order to be successful. It's just that if you focus on the average answer, if you ask people as a whole what they do to prepare for tests, what they do to learn, they will tell you mostly these 11 things. But if you only pull out the answers from the top students, the ones who are legitimately the most successful, the ones that seem to enjoy learning the most, 
I dare say the ones who view learning maybe differently than the average student, and you ask them, what is it that you do to prepare, to learn? They say, I sleep. I sleep consistently each and every night. I also eat. I make sure that my blood glucose levels aren't too out of balance at any given time, whether it be in the morning or in the afternoon or night. I also am passionate. I'm intense. I'm emotional. I make information meaningful by getting into that information. I make information personal so that it's easier for it to stick. I also embrace the struggle, something the great Robert Bjork at UCLA has termed desirable difficulty. And finally, the best students say they practice, they rehearse, although they don't memorize. They don't do it mindlessly. Their practice is much smarter. They use elaborate rehearsal techniques. They go above and beyond with the information. And more importantly, when they are practicing, they use the test, practice test, quizzes, as a study technique. Bjork and others in the field of learning science have referred to this category of using test in this way as retrieval practice. Speaking of practice, here's a clear demonstration of the power of taking practice tests. In this study, I asked my students to use some time in class just to read. So for a week, I asked them to simply use some time in class to read through some items. I asked another group of students to use half that time reading through the information, and then I gave them the other half that time to take pop quizzes on that information. And then one week later, I asked both groups to take a new quiz. And as you can see from the screen, the students in the read-only study group did much poorer than the students in the read and pop quiz group on that test a week later. Now, had I given that test immediately after they studied, this may have looked a little different. But if learning is something that you want to hold on to, if you want to retain so that you can bring it back to memory later on down the road so that it can be useful later in your life, it appears as though this is more of a best practice appears to be something special about taking tests. Taking tests. By the way, all students in this scenario received the same extra credit, no matter what their score ultimately was on that pop quiz a week later. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, well, isn't that just like sneaking a peek? Aren't you really just giving students the questions to study or to look at and memorize? I mean, who hasn't taken a test and then the teacher give you the exact same test the next day to take? And you do much better without ever studying. So when Robert Bjork or others give these practice testing sessions, they are not giving students the same test on the delayed test. They're giving them a different test. And not only that, they're also playing around with any combination of fact-based questions as well as conceptual questions. Now, you might be thinking, well, if this is true, if these things are true about the power of taking tests before you actually take the one that counts, if that can really lead to learning, if it can really enhance your memory long term, then why don't more people take advantage of it? Right? Shouldn't students take advantage of this? Shouldn't my students right now watching me talk about this take advantage? Shouldn't they be doing sample tests right now? Well, if you look at this study here, again by Rodiger in 2006 and his student Karpecki, you notice that over here on the uh, graph that says final exam performance, those students who were just in reading, 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 reading sessions before they waited on their delayed test scored much less than those in the reading, reading, reading testing, the green group, and those students in that group scored less than the people in the reading, testing, testing, testing group. In other words, what you're seeing is, under the final exam performance, students in the, represented by the red bar graph, who did the poorest on that delayed recall test, 
I believe this is two weeks after they studied. They did worse than students who actually did some reading, as represented by the green bar, or hardly any reading at all, as represented by the blue bar. Clearly, it appears as though testing, quizzing oneself during that time, had the greatest result. That is, it predicted success a week or two later, better than just reading by itself or doing mostly reading. Now, when you ask those same students right after they take the test and get their, get their scores back, hey, what did you think about the, test, uh, the study paradigm? You ask the people who didn't do too well, who only read, what do you think about your reading in preparing you for the test? How well do you think it prepared you? Look at how well they thought it prepared them. And conversely, when you ask the people in the one reading session, three testing sessions, as represented by the blue under did it help me, they said, no, I don't believe it helped me at all. This despite the fact that the evidence is right before their eyes. They did better. So even when I can demonstrate, not just in a graph, but demonstrate to you on your own test that a particular strategy does or doesn't work, it's still very difficult to wriggle out of that mindset, that bias. I don't think it would work in your class, Mr. McCoy. That's what some of my students have said. Well, this is a graph from a couple of years ago where I asked students to uh, come to my office if they wanted to and take practice tests. And what you see is the group of students who showed up in my office to take all their practice tests. That would be at least four of them throughout the semester averaged a much higher grade in the class than those that never came in. This is remarkable because I showed this information to every single group of students I have. And I tell them these are actual students from yesteryear. They were students just like you who had the opportunity to take sample tests, who were preparing for the same test you are taking this semester. You have the advantage of seeing this data, seeing the mistake that a lot of the students who didn't take practice tests made. The question is, what will my students do this semester? Now, I know I've thrown a lot of information at you, but before I go, I want to just remind you of the acronym CE. Remember that there are some strategies that work. There are some strategies that work, and we know this, if, if for no other reason, than the best students when surveyed about what they do specifically to get ready for a test, if they want to learn what do they do, they tell us they sleep consistently, they eat consistently, they emote when they're trying to learn and remember, and they elaborate or use enhanced techniques. And finally, they practice, but they practice smarter. They practice specifically in a way that uses testing as a means to learning, instead of testing as a way of checking in and proving that you can produce or reproduce something. If you want to learn more about these techniques, please consider the book Made, Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning. That's all I have for today. I'm so glad you joined me, and I genuinely do thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.